Hey gang, welcome back for another video here on Joechem. Okay gang, this might be one of the most uncharacteristic Joechem videos out there. This is gonna involve zero structures, zero mechanisms, zero arrows. Uh, yeah, we're just gonna be talking about protein structure. So if you're a biology person, you might know most, if not everything I'm about to say. If you're not a biology person like I was in organic chemistry, you might learn something new or two. So we're just gonna talk about the four types of protein structure, primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. So those words are familiar to us as far as yeah, how we classify carbons and how many carbons they are attached to. So we're just gonna learn some definitions. It's gonna be a real light and breezy episode. I'm either burping or yawning, I'm not sure. So, protein structure. So, right off the bat, we're gonna talk about primary structure. Okay, so primary structure is, so again, in a protein, right? So, and I, maybe I shouldn't have even written peptide, but essentially, right, proteins consist of long peptides, right? So, when, so a protein's primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids, in the protein, okay? So, right, because we have discussed that proteins consist of amino acids, or sorry, of peptides, and peptides are just amino acids strung together, right? You know, I, protein, this is not the case, but we're just gonna have a bunch of tiny little boxes, right, with amino acid abbreviations. So, a pro, you know, primary structure says, okay, we have phenylalanine, we have cysteine, we have leucine, you know, yada, yada, yada. If a protein has something different than that order of boxes, whether it's, you know, what are, you know, A, B, and C, you know, C, B, A, right? That is what a, that's what a protein's primary structure is. Just what amino acids are involved and what order are they in, okay? So, secondary structure. And this one I think is maybe the one that kind of involves a little bit of organic explanation. So, there's two types of secondary structure. You're probably familiar with both of them. There's, so, this, this is involved with how the protein is kind of in, like, how it orients itself in space. So, you can have two different types. You can have a beta pleated sheet. Of course, I'm having some spelling issues. A beta pleated sheet. Or you can have what is called an alpha helix. Okay? So, what does a beta pleated sheet look like? It kind of looks like this. It's not gonna be a great artist renditioning, but it's kind of like you have your amino acids in a row and you kind of just like, it's almost like you went on a roller coaster that went up and then down the other side, okay? I'm gonna explain why that confirmation is favorable, why it's in, why are beta pleated sheets, uh, sheets adopted, not sheets. <laughs> so alpha helixes, that's kind of when your chain is like a, a, like a, it's, it's kind of like a coil. It's just gonna keep going like this. It's like a spiral going upwards, okay? So why are both of these, uh, why do proteins adopt these struct, like these, these conformations? Why do we see the secondary structure in nature? It all comes down to hydrogen bonding in both cases, right? So, oh, you put that over here. It's all about H bonding. So, with beta pleated sheets, what you see is you have all your amino groups kind of jutting out like this, right? Now, the, I'm talking about the nitrogen. So this is the backbone, right? So I've not drawn the R groups whatsoever. Both of these secondary structures deal with the backbones of your peptides, right, of your, of your proteins. So we're not talking about R groups whatsoever. So actually, I should do this a little bit more effectively. Let me kind of almost swipe a little bit out right there. So inside, you have a nitrogen. It's gonna have a hydrogen sticking out. So in a beta pleated sheet, you know, you have one side go up and the other side go down. The reason why this works is because you're going to run into a carbonyl on the other side and one of its lone pairs is going to hydrogen bond with a, nit with a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen on the other side. So you have this effect, whoops, where you have nitrogens and oxygens, so I would say hydrogens attached to nitrogens interacting with the oxygens on the other side. So you have this across the beta pleated sheet type hydrogen bonding interaction going on, 
right? And what that means also, right, is because we know we zigzag like this, right? So if this is a nitrogen and this is an R group, and then we know that we have, you know, we have R groups going up and down, up and down, up and down. That means your R groups will also be, you'll have like an R group sticking out here, you'll have an R group sticking out here, R group sticking up here. That's not so important, but I just want to kind of note that, okay? So you have hydrogen bonding between the two parallel strands of the beta pleated sheet, and then you have your R groups kind of going above and below the beta pleated sheet as well, okay? So remember also, you might also wonder why that's, why that's such an interesting thing that you go up and then you gradually loop around. Remember, our backbones are rigid. Right, because of the fact that peptide bonds are not exactly totally cool doing you know rotation because of the resonance in the you know amide functional group. Okay, beta pleated sheet. So now alpha helix, what's going on with that? Again, it comes down to hydrogen bonding. I can't draw this because it's gonna look terrible, but what you have to just trust me that when an alpha helix is happening, let me draw this a little bit bigger. you basically have an amino acid here, and then four, roughly four, not always four, but roughly four amino acids, oh, let me draw it a little bit better, four amino acids ahead, you get that same hydrogen bonding effect that we see over here in the beta pleated sheet. So instead of it being one strand up, one strand down, it's like we have a much tighter spiral, and you just know that the person you're going to coordinate with is just four amino acid residues ahead of you, if that makes sense. But the point being is that primary structure is the sequence of amino acids and the composition you actually have in your peptide, your you know polypeptide. But secondary structure is just how the backbone is interacting with itself and how, based on those interactions, how does it orient itself in space? Is We know there's gonna be hydrogen bonding, but is it an alpha helix or is it a beta pleated sheet, okay? So tertiary structure. Okay, so tertiary structure is, we have a, so, you know, smaller peptides, right? Tripeptides, tetrapeptides, blah, blah, blah. They can have primary structure. You start to get longer, you get secondary structure. When you have a full-blown protein, you get tertiary structure. It's kind of how the protein folds across itself. And... This is largely affected by what kind of R groups you have. So if you have a giant, 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 giant protein, right? It's a giant spaghetti monster. At this point, right, you have so many sections of beta pleated sheets or alpha helixes, right? Eventually, different parts are going to be interacting with other sections, right? So maybe you have a few different R groups that are starting to kind of tangle with each other. And maybe you have two different cysteines, right? Maybe you have sulfur in two different places and those come together and they can actually bond with each other and form what's called a disulfide bridge, okay? So that's why when you get very large and spaghetti monster-like, you can have tertiary structure and it's how that different areas of a protein find other areas and interact with it and fold and do stuff like that. A lot of that comes into play when you're talking about enzymes and, and other things like that. And uh, what's interesting about tertiary structure is based on what's actually you know interacting. Like I said, I use this disulfide bridge for it as an example. If if you heat if you heat proteins or have harsh pH conditions. So if you really crank up the temperature or you really you, you put a protein in a situation where it's super acidic or super basic it might react differently and it might fold differently and it changes how the protein behaves and reacts in certain situations. So tertiary structure is subject to change. So what's interesting is primary structure is, you know, bond to bond connection, right? Secondary structure is hydrogen bonding, right? And there's not really anything to get around there because this is like a, a, you know, because of the rigidity of our backbone, this is going to be some fixed structure. It's not bond to bond, but it's pretty fixed, right? But tertiary structure can change based on conditions that you have. And last but not least, there's something called quaternary structure. And that's actually when you when you have a when you have a protein party, you get a bunch of proteins together, and you have protein, it's like tertiary structure, like tertiary structure, tertiary interactions, but you have it between different 
big proteins, different polypeptides. It's also protein-protein interaction, okay? Okay, gang, so I hope if you're a biology person and you stopped on by for some protein fun, peptide fun, you learned something. And if you were like me, who is, you know, walking the organic or just chemical, you know, straight and narrow, but not that much biology background, hopefully you learned something too. Okay, gang, thank you so much for watching and hopefully for liking and subscribing. If you want more, you know, we talked about uh, drawing and naming peptides in one of a previous video, but if you're looking for how to make them, peptide synthesis, stick around, find that video, I'll have it linked in the description, but uh, regardless, no matter what, I'll see you all in the next video.